was a very quiet, still night. No clouds, you could hear everything. People shouting, help, I'm on the 14th floor. Everybody was shocked, to be honest. Like, it was like a dream. It was just madness. I couldn't believe it. It felt like a action slash horror movie at the same time. But you're in it. Just red, red flames, uh, then the smoke was, you know, horrendous. I started telling myself, this should not be happening. This is, this is bad. This is very bad. I've never seen a fire like this. I've never seen people die like this. No. To me, I was dead already. I've lost five friends in that block. And it was Armageddon. My husband was saying, just don't look, but you can't. It was mesmerizing. And there was nothing we could do. What were you doing that night? I was playing cards with a few friends in my flat. My, one of my friends was leaving. As soon as she opened my door, the landing was full of smoke and she ran back into my flat. Then me and another friend ran out onto the landing to see what was happening. And there was a guy run out of the flat opposite me. He was on the phone ringing for a fireman. And he was saying something on the phone like his fridge has caught fire or something. And that's the first I knew of it. I got woken up by the noise from outside. When I heard it first, I didn't believe it. I tried to go back to sleep. I didn't think too much about it. It's the, the fire's not in my flat. It's on the opposite side to me. Obviously, the firemen are on their way. So I just went back into my flat with my two, well, with my friends. Then I heard it louder. Fire, fire. But it was kind of like a serious kind of noise. It wasn't like... Oh, there's a fire. It sounds like, like, like fire. Like you can hear loads of people like kind of screaming it. So I had to get up and I woke up my partner and my daughter. I went home, changed, and I lay down on my bed. That's when I heard a lot of sound, police vans, cars zooming around. I heard a helicopter going around. We were awoken by, we could hear slight kind of buzzy noises. Anyway, you're half asleep, it's about one o'clock. I'd only just started, gone to bed. Um, and we were woken by our neighbour George shouting, get them out, get them out. We were outside in, in a shop we were sitting and I received a call from Mohammed. He, he told us to come to help him because the fire started and they couldn't get out of the building. When I arrived, I saw Muhammad. I saw him, I said to him, are you like next to the window? He said, yes. I said to him, just raise your hand. And he raised. I saw him the last time it was. When I woke up, we looked at the fire and I quite quickly realized it wasn't just a small event. And I don't know whether I did the right thing or not. I woke my daughter up. And I told her to come and look. She was very anxious about who, who was in there. She was Snapchatting her friends, one of whom uh, had been talking to a girl on the 23rd floor um, while she lost consciousness. And we watched the flame shoot up the northeast side and engulf the top floors of which she is part of very quickly within 15, 20 minutes. And she was pretty hysterical. We are a relatively, you know, poor, social housing, very, it's a very big mix of people here and it's essentially very friendly and everyone says hello to each other in the streets. You know, all the people are on the missing posters, I recognise them. I knew it through my friend. She called me about 20 past one to say, um, are you asleep? I said, no. She said, well, your building is on fire and we can see that it's approaching your floor. 
So can you just get out? And I was like, okay. And I can sense the panic on her phone. So that made me panic. So we went and waked up the children. They were asleep. Uh, my son wanted to wear his trousers. I said to him, forget it. Just come out in your shorts. He wanted to put his shoes on. I said, I haven't got time. Just get out. The fire's bad, really bad. I don't know how many people have come And we were asking them if there was any help that we could do. And they said no. And there were people looking out of the window and the firefighters were shouting to them saying, don't come out, stay inside, we are coming to get you. I'm hearing people shouting from the street to evacuate, to get out of your flats. I'm thinking, well, if people are shouting for me to evacuate outside, maybe I should. So I got to the stairs, went down the stairs. When I got to the, not to the actual ground level, the walkway level, that's when I see loads of firemen and, and I just proceeded to leave the building. Then we tried to run out the door. That's when the massive smoke, I can't describe it to you. You have to be there to see it, but I wish you would never be in that sort of situation. It's like a, we're coming towards the house. So we shut the door straight away. When I opened the door, just a big black smoke, just, you know, dazed into the house. I started to panic. I shut the door and then my husband said, you know, come on, grab it. And then I said, just close your nose and just let's get out. Something I won't ever be able to get out of my mind is a chap in the corner um, waving a jumper out of the window. And I watched the flames engulf his flat from both sides. You know, it went round the building, it went up the chimney, started fire at the top, burnt down from the top and went laterally around the building from both sides, from the northeast corner like this, from the top all the way down. You know, we just sat there and watched it. There are people in the building. There were people on this side of the building screaming out, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. But I, I immediately texted all my friends and told them to pray for them, that this building is on fire, there are several people inside. And this was, this was quite early into the fire, and I texted it to all my friends worldwide. The fire was... It was like an envelope. It was going to get them. Put like a towel and blanket and things like that around the door. My partner was holding it. So she, while she's holding it, I've run in the bathroom now and I've, start, I've got water and I start pouring it at the door. But while I was doing that, the smoke was kind of sipping through the door. And then uh, there was a, fi uh, a fire brigade guy opened the fire door uh, exit to go through the stairs and uh, he just telling people to get out. Um, my husband inhaled a lot of smoke because he was carrying no saber. She was, they all were with smoke. It's only when I get to the bottom of the floor that I, f I saw how, you know, how serious it was the fire and how quick it was spreading. I was asking guys around me, is the, is the house made of cardboard? Because that's how it seemed like. It seemed like it was paper and there was, there was actually sound coming out when it was burning, like crackling sound. That's the exact sound. It just kept burning and it never, it was not, it didn't show signs of going out. Then I started to tie, I started tying things together, like blankets. I went around every room in the house, all the dirty blankets, all the clean ones, all the old ones we don't use. I started tying them together. And my partner asked me what I was doing. But I just carried on doing it. Yeah, well, I went back to the window. I started screaming, fire, fire, help, please. Help, help, I've got a child here, help, please. Then the fire brigade came in. Every 10 minutes I was in contact with him. So we tried to go to firemen and tell them, please, uh, 14th floor, the number 112. And then they moved to another flat, the next flat, 113. Yeah, they knocked on the door and they said, uh, listen, your, your flat seems to be the safest flat at the moment. Can we bring some of your neighbours into your house? Yeah, why not? Yeah, bring them in. So they were eight in the, in the flat. The Syrian refugees. They brought them in my house. They brought an Irish guy called Dennis. They brought Zainab and her son, a two-year-old son, the lady from Syria alone. So while they was in my flat, I carried on my survival mode. I carried on tying all the um, blankets and everything together and everyone was looking at me like I was crazy. Like, what are you doing? Because from outside, people were shouting, stay in your flat, they're going to come and help you, they're going to come and help you. 
and then we crossed over to the other blocks uh, through go through the stairs and to my mum's blocks made sure the children were safe at my mum's house and then I came out to to watch what's going on at the building and then that time the fire starting to go around so one side then to the other side and to the final side and we heard people uh, you know wanted to throw the sheets in order to go down they told them not to I don't do hey! it! Don't do it! I kept on tying anyway, tied it as strong as I could tied it, then I tied it around the window tied it so hard, as, as hard as I could and people were telling me not, what are you doing? Don't do it. But I wasn't looking to die in there. So I've climbed out the window now and I've told my partner to pass me my daughter. But my daughter wasn't having it. She was crying. She was like, like almost like, what are you doing? Like, like she was crying. I don't like, yeah, anyway, yeah. All right, so now my daughter isn't coming. Now I've got to get back into the flat because I'm not going to go down without my daughter. So now I'm finding it difficult to get back into the flat because I'm dangling from outside of the window from the 14th floor. The Syrian guy and his brother pulled me back in because I couldn't pull myself back in. The screams that I heard were not screams of... They were screams of desperation, actually. I think they were screams like when you have nothing else to do, and those were the screams they were because people until then were just waving and just trying to do something about it but you actually scream and you can't do anything and I still remember one scream was a blood curdling scream that came out from the apartment there was no screaming after that no this might sound selfish, but God forgive me, I hope it's not selfish, yeah? But I was thinking about me first, my partner, and my daughter. Then everybody else after. I've tied, this is what Africans do, you know when they put like a child behind their back and they tie, the, they tie him up here, yeah? So I've put two wrap, two of it, I tied so tight, yeah? So when I have to go through that window again, my daughter doesn't fall off my back. Anyway, I'm about to go through the window again. The fire brigade has come and said, run! So we've run now, yeah? I've grabbed my missus by hand. My daughter tied to my back already. And I didn't look back. I don't know who followed us. I don't know who stayed in the building. We just ran. Maybe around three, half past three, he said to me, I can't find Omar. I said to him, I said to him, what, what, what do you mean you, you can't find Omar? He was with you. He said to me, it's smoky out in the flat. We can't see each other. I said to him, just try to shout and say Omar. He was shouting like so high, like he was shouting and he didn't answer. A friend of mine was ringing, ringing firemen, telling them to come and help him. And he was told to stay put in his flat. He was screaming from the block. I could hear him screaming. So I phoned him on his mobile phone. And I started talking to him on the phone. I tried to tell him, wet a towel and put it around his head and get out of the flat. He said, John, I cannot get out of the flat. He said, the, the floor is burning. He said, there's flames up here, there's fire, there's smoke. He could not get out of the flat. He said, I'm going into the bathroom to shut the door. And then the, his phone went dead. And then I see his whole flat engulfed by flames. I ran to the other side and I saw Omar, he was like smoke, like all the smoke, he can't breathe. He was like in bad situation and he tried to call Muhammad again. He said, Muhammad said to him, I can't because I have family with me. I have children, I have women with children. So he didn't leave because of the children and the woman. But it was pitch black, so like we found our way through the thing, yeah, and we're all coughing and choking and like, I can't describe this choking. Uh, you would, please, God, I pray no one don't ever have to go through that, yeah. We're going through that now, and I can't describe the smoke. It's literally like I was gonna die at that moment. I got to like the, I don't know, cause everything was pitch black. But I'm just assuming, I'm just giving like an example, maybe like the tenth floor or the eighth floor, and I was. To me, I was dead already. 
I didn't think I was going to make it. My daughter behind me crying. Like, uh, 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 she's like all behind me, like stretching and doing all this thing. My partner is like falling down the stairs. I'm trying to make sure I don't, I don't lose her. I'm trying to make sure my daughter's thing. And I'm trying to be strong for myself. I'm strong for my family at the same time. It's, it's mad. I gave up. I watched and I saw that, you know, my house was literally in fire. People screaming, help, help, and, you know, waving with, you know, with sheets. It just, it wasn't good to see. But also we heard, you know, they were telling them at that time when, this, when the fire started to spread, they told them to stay in. I mean, come on, if you're not going to help them, let them help themselves. I swear, I don't, I'm telling you, God, God helped. I don't know. We kept on going anyway, and we got to, like, the fourth floor or something, then I could see that the next floor below, there's light. So that kind of gave you that kind of energy, you just one more push, if you, if you get where I'm coming from here. So I've got, we've gone down now, my partner's run off here, I was thinking I'm still following her here, but I wasn't following her. The fire brigade had stopped us and tried to take my daughter away from my back here to rescue her, innit? But because I've, I've tied her so tight because I was going to take her through the window, so it was kind of a struggle. So while I'm there, I'm still kind of inhaling some smoke and my daughter is still kind of inhaling smoke. My, my partner is like waiting for us and she's all scared like, where are these people? Right, right, right. Anyway, so they grabbed my daughter off me and took all of us to safety. We go out of there. <laughs> So when we go out now, they posted a safe area, and I've seen one of the people that was in the flat, just one, one of the Syrian guys, the one that survived. He's coming to us and he goes, oh, have you seen my brother? And my partner was going to go, yes, rare, rare, rare. Like, I'm like, listen here, please don't give this guy false hope here. Yeah? Next thing, I don't know who rang each other, but they rang each other, and his brother asked him, said something to him like, why did he leave me? He was still up there. So between uh, half past three and till four, because I was just go around and check and tell them there is room, like uh, flat 113, please, could you help them? And I left Omar, he was talking to him with some friend. So the last time was half past three. He said to me, just tell my mom, like, to forgive me and like, please tell her I love them, all the family. I went to the community center where my housemates were. I found them there and we started setting up tables and food and making tea for people. And that's when, when I was making tea, some hot water fell on my hands and, and that's when I realized how hot it must be inside for people there who are actually in the fire. And that's when I left that and came back outside again at four o'clock. There were, there were a lot of ambulances that, at that time trying to get in. And just standing there on one corner and looking at the building, doing nothing. Nothing. I mean, there's nothing you could do about it. They brought five people in my flat, so there was eight of us all together. Me, came out, I came out, my missus came out, my daughter came out, and one more person. Everybody else died. Listen, I can't sleep at night. I've lost so much weight. I'm, I've gone very skinny. I can't sleep at night. It keeps playing in my head. Could I have saved the little boy? Like, even if I couldn't do nothing about the adults, could I have saved the little boy? That just keeps playing in my head. For what reason? For what reason? Like, none of us deserve it. None of the people that have died deserve it. Like, for what reason? Why? Why? I still remember his voice. I still remember the bit when he was standing on the window and what he was saying to me. When I look to the building, I see, I see him, I see, I can hear his voice again. You know, it's too, too much, you know. After the fire, I was putting myself in the scenario like this. What would I do if... And frankly, I had no idea. Would I jump out with a mattress? Would I tie myself to something and let myself down? But I wouldn't have anything at that point. I'm, I'm sleeping. What would I do? I don't know what I do, frankly. 
I do not know what I'd do. We just started to look for him in the hospitals to see if he's alive or not. So we went around with his cousin and some friends. So we went and we looked for, like, we were looking for him, but we didn't find anything. Yeah. The next day we, we saw pictures on Facebook of him. So we know he, he passed away. I feel guilty sometimes because I couldn't help him. But I can't do anything because all the areas, we can't go inside or to go upstairs and to do something or, you know, out of our control. You know, my daughter would really like to know where her friend is so that she can have some kind of, I mean, closure is not the right word, but, you know, move on to the next stage of the grieving process. And then over the ensuing days, there have been missing posters everywhere. So for a 13-year-old child, there's still the thought that her, her friend may have made it. But, you know, obviously we all know missing means dead. I've had probably about 10 hours sleep in one week. I can't even go in the dark myself. I'm scared of the dark, a grown-ass man. Scared of the dark. Imagine going to the toilet and you have to switch on the light quickly. Like, things like that. How long is that going to happen for? I can't go back to work. You see the building I run on my, on my workplace? It's about the same height as this. I don't know if I can go back and do the same thing. Like, every little thing is just going to get me scared and paranoid. My daughter's 13. You know, there are many children at her school who are missing, who are not there. You know, she woke up and said, what are, we, what are they, you know, that sort of mind that goes mad. She said, what are we going to do when we go to school and they call the register out? Which was, we all just looked at her and went, oh my God, I can't cope with that. Um, and luckily they're not calling the register out at school. Like we, we saw a lot of things in our life, to be honest. Like war, we went to the UK like in bad situation. You know, it was like we are a new country. We don't have, we, we didn't speak language, the English language. And then after three years, we, we built something like we, we, we stand on our feet and then like, like we lost everything and we lost uh, our friend, you know. I can't believe it until now. Always when I go to see my family, he was saying to me always, we missed you. Now we are missing him. Yeah. I don't want to be part of an angry mob. I just want a voice for our neighborhood. I want a voice for our nation and I want this to change. We can't have the burning martyrs at Grenfell die for nothing. This has to mean something and we have to change things. And now is the moment for change. There's no amount of money or anything that you can do here that would, that would, that would help how I feel. Put it this way, if you put a billion pounds right in my face now, just me by myself, try to attempt. You see what I survived? to attempt to see if I'll survive it again, I wouldn't do it, because I thought I died already. The initial um, response from the neighbourhood was of love and help and horror about what happened. And everyone brought food, clothes, um, you know, everything the council hadn't provided. And everyone's sitting there waiting for the council to do some kind of, uh, you know, coordinated response and they didn't come and they didn't come and we were all saying don't get angry don't get angry but we're angry but it will calm, it will it will calm down and out of that we will change something because this can't happen ever again I wish I could go in there it sounds crazy but I want to see what I survived from because I can't believe I'm still here it's very heartbroken and it will never it will never heal no matter how what time it will never feel forgotten we need a place to live in, not just in a hotel and maybe after that move to another hotel or something. We need to start again. We need to start settle in. You just 
that's what all we need. I need to get myself, I need to sleep. I need to be able to sleep. <laughs>